When attempting to understand problems rooted in a large and complex system, you can learn a lot by first identifying patterns evident in smaller, more manageable subsets of the problem. If your observations and analyses are solid, these patterns can then lead to accurate predictions with useful application to the whole. As systems go, you'd have a hard time finding one larger and more complex than the American system of finance, which, as you may have noticed, is in the process of collapsing. At this point, the most urgent question is, how much worse is this economic collapse going to get? As you might imagine, that question is hard to address from way up here, but we might just find some hints if we begin by zooming in and looking way down here, which is exactly what we're going to do. We'll start with Sedona Corporation, a Pennsylvania-based software developer which, in 1999, was one of many publicly traded high-tech firms looking to exchange stock for financing. Then came along a hedge fund called Rhino Advisors and Thomas Badian, its president. Badian introduced Sedona to Amro International, a shadowy offshore investment fund registered in Panama and headquartered in Switzerland. Quite a combination. Amro offered Sedona $3 million in debt that could be converted to stock. If shares of Sedona increased in value, Amro would get fewer shares. If Sedona fell, Amro would get more shares, meaning it was in Amro's interest to see Sedona's stock fall. And fall it did, often as a result of waves of impossibly large amounts of selling that, counterintuitively, could be counted on to follow the announcement of good news. This went on for a while, and Sedona's share price was reduced to pennies. Now, it didn't take long before Sedona, like so many other small public companies in the same position, finally cracked the code. The market wasn't determining a share price. Instead, Sedona was being manipulated down through an illegal practice known as naked short selling by somebody who stood to gain from the drop. Armed with evidence of illegal manipulation, just like so many other small public companies before and since, Sedona went to the Securities and Exchange Commission for help. Normally, things would have ended there. You see, the SEC is notoriously indifferent to complaints of illegal naked shorting. In fact, an internal investigation recently revealed that of 5,000 complaints of naked shorting received in the 18 months beginning January 1, 2007, not one resulted in any action. Not one. The reason for the SEC's indifference is that only big Wall Street players even have the ability to naked short. And as it happens, SEC staffers dream of jumping ship to work for big Wall Street players, not small public companies. This creates a certain disincentive to SEC regulators regulating, as doing so would negatively impact their career prospects. This revolving door dynamic is reinforced in the minds of SEC staffers when their former co-workers do what they were hired to do, which is call in, usually from their posh Wall Street offices, lobbying to make inconvenient SEC investigations into their employers go away. But here's where Sedona's story diverges from the norm and, ultimately, the only reason I'm even telling you about it now. The SEC actually did investigate the illegal naked shorting of Sedona. So what made Sedona special? Well, this might be the one case in which the SEC's revolving door managed to swing in the company's favor. That's because a retired member of Sedona's board of directors is a former SEC commissioner, and he personally lobbied the regulator to look into the case, which it did. And now I'm going to tell you what the SEC found when it did. Now, remember AMRO, the shadowy offshore investment fund that lent Sedona $3 million under terms that became more attractive as Sedona's shares dropped in value? Well, anticipating AMRO might be tempted to apply downward pressure on its stock, Sedona stipulated in the loan agreement that AMRO was specifically prohibited from selling shares of Sedona short. And in the strictest sense, AMRO kept its side of the bargain. You see, instead of shorting Sedona stock itself, AMRO paid Thomas Badian's hedge fund, Rhino Advisors, to do it for them. Badian, if you'll recall, is the guy who brokered the deal between Sedona and AMRO in the first place. Rhino's task was a simple one, do whatever necessary to manipulate Sedona's share price down as much as possible. There are many ways to accomplish that, all of them happen to be illegal, but one method turns out to be particularly attractive, simple and, thanks to a co-opted SEC, almost entirely risk-free, naked short selling. Just as Sedona suspected, this was the tactic that was being used against it. Now here's how it worked. Beginning in March of 2001, Rhino Advisors instructed stock brokerage Refco to sell millions and millions of Sedona shares, which Refco did. 
The only problem is, Rhino did not own any shares of Sedona. Unknown to those who bought them, Refco was not selling real shares of Sedona at all, but share entitlements, which are like IOUs that can be bought or sold as though they were the real thing. That would have been legal had Rhino managed to come up with a corresponding number of actual shares to deliver the buyers within three days, but Rhino had no intention of doing so. As the SEC's investigation determined, Badian and Rhino failed to deliver these shares to the accounts where the sales occurred. As a result, Rhino's short sales increased the supply of Sedona shares in the market and depressed the price. As Rhino did this, Refco went to great lengths to hide what was really happening, and because its sales were not reported or printed to the NASDAQ tape, the short sales were not reported to the market. Well, caught red-handed by the SEC, Rhino closed up shop and Thomas Badian fled the country. This is the essence of naked short selling, and it's how rogue hedge funds like Rhino Advisors have managed to kill or severely damage hundreds upon hundreds of small public companies. All the while, the accounting works like this. Rhino owes the real shares to Repco, and Repco owes them to the people who unknowingly bought IOUs. And because these fails can persist for weeks, months, or even years, it's possible for a brokerage that engages in naked short selling, like Repco, to amass a substantial liability in the form of shares they've sold but not yet purchased. Furthermore, because such a liability would be evidence of the brokerage engaging in illegal activity, it would need to be kept hidden. Now, here's where things get really interesting. As it turns out, Refco did indeed spend years dealing with what, by 2005, had grown into a half billion dollar liability disguised to look like an asset by temporarily passing it off to a company controlled by Refco CEO just before the end of every quarter. That went on for years, until the third quarter of 2005 when somebody forgot to make the swap and Refco's auditors spotted the liability. Within days of the liability's disclosure, Refco declared bankruptcy. And what about Refco's half billion dollar liability? What was that? Well, we may never know, because like a radioactive waste bill, the courts rushed in to seal information about it and everything related to it, claiming that to do otherwise would cause irreparable harm. Of course, normally bankruptcies, no matter how sorted, are handled in the public, but not Refco's. This was very strange. But before all the hazmat teams arrived to seal the area off, a few clues about Refco's mysterious radioactive liability managed to leak out. In one early report, an anonymous Refco insider said the receivables were from a long-standing hedge fund client to the firm. And a source familiar with the investigation said the receivables probably came from short sale positions made from a shuttered hedge fund. Here's another clue. In late October of 2005, red flags began to fly when creditors noticed that in a disclosure filed a few months before Refco's implosion, the company listed among its liabilities over $10 billion of securities sold, not yet purchased, at market or fair value. As the Financial Times reported, typically such a notation is used to describe stock that is sold short, but the investigators have been unable to find which shares, if any, were involved. As a result, Investigators working on behalf of Refco creditors are examining whether the bankrupt commodities trading firm engaged in more than $10 billion worth of naked shorting. Here's another clue. A few pages down in that same document, Refco disclosed that even though Rhino was long gone, the years-old SEC investigation into the attack on Sedona had expanded substantially with respect to Refco's role. In this key portion, relating to Santo Maggio, who was head of Repco's broker-dealer operation and someone who is certain to have known about any naked shorting going on. We read this disclosure. Maggio has been in negotiations with the SEC staff and likewise is near a resolution of certain supervisory matters raised in the investigation. Now, the significance of Maggio's role is greatly reinforced in 2007 when the SEC finally filed a complaint against him stating Maggio played a significant role in concealing hundreds of millions of dollars of related party receivables. In other words, of concealing this mysterious radioactive liability. Let's review the clues. We know Refco's half billion dollar mystery radioactive liability was generated by a long-standing hedge fund client to the firm that had since gone away. Maybe Rhino? We know it was made up of short sale positions presumably left unsettled when that hedge fund closed up shop. Given the amounts involved, it must have been a rather sudden demise. That certainly doesn't rule out Rhino. 
which was a hedge fund, as you'll recall, that was closed unexpectedly precisely because it engaged in illegal naked shorting through Revco. We know the SEC investigation that started before Revco's implosion by examining Santo Maggio's supervisory role in Rhino's naked shorting of Sedona culminated two years later in a complaint accusing Maggio of being instrumental in hiding the mystery radioactive liability. Now that would seem to directly link the liability with Rhino and naked shorting. We also know that creditors combing through the rubble at Repco encountered some unknown, though presumably large amount, of short positions for which no corresponding long shares could be found. In other words, naked short positions. Put it all together and you get what I'm betting is a half billion dollars, probably more, of naked shorts, that is to say IOUs, out there bouncing around the market that Revco owns investors like you and me who believe they have real shares in their brokerage accounts. That's right, if you own stock, you too might be a Revco creditor and not even know it. Of course, what makes radioactive waste so problematic is that it costs much more to clean the stuff up than it does to actually make it. And similarly, what financial markets value at half a billion dollars would cost many, many times that amount to actually go out and buy in. Revco couldn't have afforded it under the best of circumstances, which is why it had no choice but to move it around. All this, in turn, would explain why the courts went to such unusual lengths to keep details of Repco's mystery radioactive liability confidential. After all, everybody knows that there's risk inherent to extending credit, but tens of thousands of investors suddenly learning the shares they bought never really existed well, that certainly would cause irreparable harm in the form of a crisis of confidence followed by a liquidity crisis, not unlike what we're seeing now. Okay, let's zoom out now to see how the patterns observed in this case might help us to understand the larger system. But before we do, we're going to take a brief math and science break. Determining how many stock IOUs are coursing through the system at any one time is about as easy as counting the number of neutrinos passing through the Earth at any one time. That's not because failed trades, like neutrinos, are tiny, nearly massless, and all but undetectable, but because the system itself goes far out of its way to obscure this information. And so, as with neutrinos, the best we can do is estimate the scope of the phenomenon. In keeping with the subatomic particle theme, you could say failed trades come in a few distinct flavors. Some are created within the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. These are easy to count because they are regularly disclosed. The balance of failed trades are created outside the DTCC, and we know much less about these. However, we do know that some occur when brokerages settle trades directly with one another in what's called X-clearing. Many others occur when clearing happens offshore. Now let's take these one at a time. Of failed trades originating within the DTCC, as of the end of March 2008, the combined value was around $9 billion. Of those originating in X-clearing, the DTCC itself has estimated the figure to be at least four times the amount clearing within the DTCC, although other credible sources conservatively estimate it and the offshore accumulation at something closer to 15 times the amount in the DTCC, or around $135 billion. Adding those two numbers together brings us to near $150 billion spread around various securities brokerages, with higher concentrations obviously in the larger ones. Before moving ahead, let's return to the pattern we observed in the case of Sedona and Repco, initially replacing specific names with general ones. When we do, it looks like this. Short-selling hedge funds seeking to drop the share price of small, publicly traded companies do so by selling vast quantities of non-existent stock through brokerages, thereby saddling those brokerages with enduring liabilities which would remain hidden until one goes suddenly bankrupt, which would then cast some light on their books. Then, trustees discover the liability, they recognize that, were the nature of it to be revealed to the public, it might just be enough to create a panic sufficient to crack the system. Recognizing this, the government takes unusual steps to mitigate the problem while hiding details of what should be a transparent process, claiming that to do otherwise would result in some serious but undefined harm to the public. Now let's see if we can find a circumstance on the macro level which this pattern might help to explain. The week of September 14, 2008, Lehman Brothers, a brokerage much larger than Refco, fell into bankruptcy. While Lehman was known to be much less likely to engage in naked shorting than the other prime brokers, the firm undoubtedly had heaps of failed trades to deal with anyway, and in quantities much larger than Refco's. 
So we have the bankrupt brokerage and failed trades. Now, if the pattern persists, we'd expect to encounter a secretive, speedily implemented government response spun as necessary to prevent some unspecified harm to the system, right? Well, the same week Lehman went bankrupt, the Federal Reserve substantially relaxed the standards which previously only allowed it to accept AAA-rated securities as collateral. At the same time, the Fed disbursed $60 billion under the primary dealer and other broker-dealer credit facility. The next week, that amount had increased by another $50 billion, and the following week by another $40 billion to reach $147 billion. So who got all that money? We don't know because the Fed won't say. Bloomberg News noticed what was going on and filed a Freedom of Information Act request seeking documents revealing the recipients of these billions and the nature of the collateral they posted. At first, the Fed stonewalled and ultimately refused to comply with Bloomberg's FOIA request, saying the U.S. is facing an unprecedented crisis in which loss of confidence in and between financial institutions can occur with lightning speed and devastating effects. Notwithstanding calls for enhanced transparency, the board must protect against the substantial multiple harms that might result from disclosure of the recipients of the Fed loans. In its considered judgment, and in view of current circumstances, it would be a dangerous step to release this otherwise confidential information. Bloomberg has since filed a lawsuit against the Fed seeking to compel release of the requested information, and I wish them luck in that effort. While it's true that any evidence that the $147 billion might have been related to a radioactive pile of fell trades discovered in Lehman's basement is circumstantial, Here's something else to consider. Three days after Lehman declared bankruptcy, the SEC, following years of refusing to take meaningful action on the matter of illegal naked shorting, or even acknowledge that it's a problem, suddenly took rather dramatic steps to limit the practice. It's as though somebody with authority had finally become aware of the Chernobyl scenario brewing beneath the surface and sent urgent word down to contain the problem. I hope this is not what's going on and look forward to being proven wrong, because if I'm correct, then we taxpayers find ourselves on the hook for billions of dollars worth of failed trades that might cost many trillions of dollars to buy in, a consequence of the greed of a few hedge funds and the ineptitude of the regulator that they captured long ago. And this whole scenario would seem to redefine the increasingly popular term, systemic risk. It would also suggest the existence of a problem that would seem to make what appeared to be a very complex problem rather insignificant by comparison. To get the latest on this problem as it evolves, in addition to suggestions on what you can do about it, please visit deepcapture.com. <laughs>